If you will, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 4. My topic today is, Can a Believer Lose His Salvation? And as Richard said, this is one of the most important topics, and we're going to get into why it's such an important topic, and we're going to, we're going to get into the hows of it. And what I want to do this morning is I want to first go over the basics. What are some basic thinking that we have to have in our mind to understand that we are eternally secure and that we cannot lose our salvation? Because the question is, can a believer lose his salvation? And the answer is clearly no in the Scriptures. But we need to understand why it's clearly no. So we'll go over the basics of that. So we'll start out with some milk, and then we're going to jump into some meat. What I find is, is when you teach eternal security, you teach it to people, and you teach that you can't lose salvation, and then you get the yeah buts, right? (laughs) The yeah but, what about this verse? And they throw verses at you. So what I want to do is I want to look at the Pauline verses, and we're going to narrow our focus to Pauline, because I hope that after this weekend... You're strong enough in the word that you can understand that the verses outside of the Pauline epistles you can deal with on the basis that they are for the nation Israel and talk to people through those things. So we're going to concentrate on the Pauline verses that people say teach you that you can lose your salvation because that when we understand those verses, what we really end up understanding is that they teach us that we can't. And they teach us exactly opposite of what the world and Christianity wants you to believe about those verses. So those are the two parts of what we're going to study today. And let's jump right in. I told you to turn to Romans chapter 4. And Romans chapter 4, verse 5. And we'll start in verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, why do I start off with this verse? The reason I start off with this verse is because the issue of whether a believer can lose his salvation or not is an issue of the gospel itself. And I don't want you to miss that. Many people think, well, you've got the gospel, and then you've got the can you lose your salvation. But true understanding of the gospel is if it's not about works, then it's about grace. And if it's about grace, and it's to him that worketh not, people who teach that you can lose your salvation, they only teach it really, and we're going to look at it in three different ways today. They teach it in a way that you can lose your salvation by doing something really bad, right? And that, that, when you teach these things, people, you know you've communicated clearly, right? Because people say, are you saying I can do this? And I always tell people, if somebody brings up an objection like that, you should be happy that you clearly communicated grace. And they say, I can, so you're saying I can do this and still be saved? And then the other way that people teach you can lose your salvation, first way is you do something really bad. The second way is that you don't do something good enough, right? And that's different because doing something bad and doing something not quite good enough are two different things. And these are the people that say you've got to endure and continue, and we're going to look at those verses. And then the last category is people who say, well, I don't believe you can do anything to lose your salvation, but you can definitely give it back. And we'll look at that. Why do I bring all that up? I bring that all up because what it really comes down to is it works or is it grace? And with a proper understanding of the gospel, we can realize that it's grace and it's not works. And if it's not works, then the issue of losing our salvation kind of goes out the window. So turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 has got to be one of my favorite presentations of the gospel. Because not only do you learn about salvation, but what you learn about is a process. The gospel is simply that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and for my sins, and that he was buried and that he rose again. 
And the Bible teaches us that when we trust in that for our soul salvation, that we're saved. Ephesians chapter 1 teaches us in verse 13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. That's a great verse, by the way, if you ever run into somebody who's teaching you about works or baptism or whatever it is about salvation and say, hey, where do I find that in that verse? Because that verse not only shows us the gospel, it shows us what happens and how it works. We hear the gospel. He says in verse, when you, whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So you hear the word of truth, which is the gospel of your salvation. And what should your response be? What happens? Whom, in whom also after that you believed. So they trusted, they believed. That's all that happens. That's all that verse tells you that happens. There's no more information in there about, well, they did this, they did that, they did this, they did that. So when somebody says, well, what about this? Just take them to that verse and say, well, where is it in that verse? It's not in there. And then it tells us that something wonderful happens. And truly, this is what our salvation is based on the gospel. It's based on Jesus Christ died for our sins. And then it tells us that when we believe that, that we're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Go to Romans chapter 8. Actually, I'm sorry. Let's go to Ephesians 4 first since you're so close. And Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 tells us this. Ephesians 1 teaches us that when we believe the gospel, that we're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You go to Ephesians chapter 4 and it tells you how long that lasts. Because that's important, right? I've got to understand how long that sealing lasts, because if I don't, I might run out of time. I might do something to... But what it says here in verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. You're sealed until the day of redemption. And the day of redemption is when Jesus Christ comes back for his purchased possession. Purchased possession. You're his at the point you believe the gospel. And he is going to come back for us and redeem us as his purchased possession. You know what I love about Romans chapter 4, verse 30? Is the very verse that tells me that, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed to the day of redemption. The very verse that people use to tell you, well, what if you grieve the Holy Spirit? They, they, they peel things out of the Bible and they take verses and they completely misuse them. And it says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, right? Why not? Is it because so he doesn't kick you out and throw you in the dumpster and be like, I'm done with you? No, why? It says because you're sealed until the day of redemption. What God does is, is, is when we sin, when we do things that grieve the Holy Spirit, we're, we're complete in Christ. We don't have to worry about our sins. But he reminds us who we are. He doesn't tell us what he's going to do to us, right? He doesn't say, if you do this, you're out. He reminds you of who you are. You're sealed until the day of redemption. Go to Romans chapter 8 now. Romans chapter 8. These are the foundational principles of understanding that we cannot lose our salvation. Romans chapter 8, verse 23 says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. He's going to redeem even our body at some point, right? We're going to gain a new body. If you go just a little bit over and you look at verse 29, it says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. When you're sealed with that, you believe the gospel, you're sealed. At that point, you are predestinated to guess what? To be conformed to the image of his son. 
And here's the way I think about it, and it might not be a good illustration, but if I get on the bus that's going to Chicago, guess where that bus is going? Chicago. <laughs> when we get in Christ, when Christ, when we believe the gospel and, and we're dead and our life is hid in Christ, we are predestinated to that point, to be conformed to the image of his son. It's not an if-then, it's you're there. It's going to happen. The Bible teaches you that. Go back to Ephesians chapter 1 and you can see this. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. When we're in Christ, guess what we are? Chosen. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Does that sound iffy to you at all? Does that sound like a maybe? When God saves us, he saves us and gives us the gift of salvation. What does Romans chapter 6 tell us? Verse 23. For the wages of sin is no, yeah, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, right? If you could lose your salvation, God would have given you a loan of salvation, not a gift. Right? Because at any point he would come back and take it. And mind you, the only thing he's going to come back and take is us. Right? <laughs> That's what these verses teach us. If we believe we can lose our salvation, so far we've got to make our gospel works. Then what we have to do is we have to be able to undo the sealing of the Holy Spirit. And we have to be able to undo the predestination unto the adoption of sons. Good luck. Good luck undoing things that God's made up his mind to do. Romans chapter 6. Let's go there real quick. We're going to be in Romans chapter 6 several times. By the way, the clock didn't start, so you're going to have to give me a hand signal. Romans chapter 6 teaches us this. Verse 4. It says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. And that's actual baptism into his death. That's not a water baptism that places us into his death. That is a baptism into his death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead, but from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. When we trust the gospel, we're baptized into Christ. Colossians chapter 3 tells us that our life is hidden. These basic principles that we've gone over and many people have gone over this weekend teach us that salvation truly is salvation and that it truly is a gift. It is not a loan. In order to lose it, you have to undo a lot of things that God does. Let's shift our focus a little bit and let's look at the three types of way people can tell you you can lose your salvation. The first one is the flesh. People tell you that you can lose your salvation because of what you do in the flesh. And there's three major verses that people use to teach you this and they're all three extremely similar and we're going to cover one in great detail and then the other two will be simple to handle as we look at them and we'll look at them very quickly but have you ever got convinced 100 percent of your salvation and then as you know we tell you what to do here's what you need to do you need to read romans through philemon and just do it over and over and as you're doing that, every once in a while, you come across a verse and you say, ah, that sounds completely different from what I was taught. And you get this panicky feeling in you. I've done it. I'm sure you have. If you haven't, you're not reading your Bible. Because those are the things that make you want to study. But I can remember years ago, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I was teaching through 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I got done teaching it. And a lady came up to me afterwards, and she was bawling, and she was in tears. And she was so upset. It was 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. 
It says this, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And this lady came up to me and she says, I have a problem with alcohol. I am a drunkard and I thought I was saved. And that verse says that I am not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Is that a legitimate concern? Matter of fact, I dare to say in the next three verses that we look at, that you have a problem with self-righteousness if you don't find yourself somewhere in there. Okay? So, when you look at those, those verses speak out to us and they say things. They say, they, we look at them and we say, oh no, I, there I am. It's in black and white on my King James Bible. What am I going to do? Because it says I'm not going to inherit the kingdom of God right there. But let's just take a stand. Let's take, calm down. Take a look and see what this says. First of all, it says, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, there's a couple ways people go about this. They say, well, that's talking about an inheritance. And by the way, when it says kingdom of God, it's not talking about the thousand year reign. It's talking about the kingdom of God in general. And it says these kinds of people aren't going to inherit it. And I'm going to give you the answer first, and then we're going to explore the answer. The answer is very simple. He tells us in verse 9, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If you've trusted the gospel, you are not unrighteous. And the reason you are not unrighteous is not because you're special. You're still... <laughs> it, it's, it's because Jesus Christ's righteousness was imputed onto you. That's basic doctrine out of the book of Romans. We've been declared righteous. We've been made righteous because of what he did. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So when he talks about this and he talks about the unrighteous, he's talking about people who haven't been made righteous. And then he goes through the list. And then the very next verse, after he goes through the list, and he says, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God being washed being sanctified and being justified are nothing that you do, are they? Those are all operations of who? Those are things that he takes care of when you trust the gospel. They're done. But here's what I really love about this passage. Sometimes what happens is we study the Bible. We get our faces in and we start digging in and we look at the verses and we see these verses and what we do is we forget to back up and look at things as a whole. So you look at those verses and it's a very easy explanation that one, you're made righteous in Christ. And two, you've been washed, sanctified and justified. So he's not talking about you. He's actually teaching the Corinthians. This is not what you look like anymore. This is not who you are in Christ. So don't do these things because it's not who you are. He's teaching them how to walk in light of their salvation. But when we back up, we get a big picture throughout the whole book of Corinthians. And the Corinthians themselves should be a picture to you of that you cannot lose your salvation. Because the things that he names in that list, I can find. Go to, go to, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 5, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Were fornicators in the list? Yes. Did he just say that there's fornicators among you? Yes. And did he just say, and such were some of you? I'm here to tell you, and such are, were some of them at that time as well. You see that? There were fornicators, and he said they weren't going to inherit the kingdom. But what he's trying to do is teach them. They're babes in Christ. I'm going to show you how to act. I'm going to show you exactly what you're supposed to do to act like that, to walk in that truth. He also talks about fornicators, or uh, I'm sorry, adulterers. 
Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He says in verse 2, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. And he says, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. So he's teaching them there how not to get caught up in fornication. Why do you teach people how not to get caught up in fornication? Because they're caught up in fornication, right? You see that? The Corinthian church, what were they caught up in? We know in, in first five, we can see that it was going on there. When you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he tells them to flee from idolatry. Why would you have to tell somebody to flee from idolatry? Yeah, because they haven't been doing it. Because there's a strong possibility that they're wrapped up in some of it. And actually, when you look what, and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and this is one of my favorite ones. When you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and you see them come together to eat, it looks more like a pagan revelry than how the church, the body of Christ, should act. <clears throat> and he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says in verse 21, For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper. One is hungry and another is what? Drunken. Are there drunkards at that local assembly there? There sure are. I'm gonna, I think there's more than one. Okay? And, and the, so how many, how many types of people do we say are present at this meal? He says there's one that's... Well, let's look at, let's look at verse 21. For one taketh his supper, his own supper, right? So he jumps up and he's got a big plate. The second guy, he's what? Hungry, so he doesn't have anything. And then the, the third guy, what is he? Drunk. Okay, does that sound like how the church, the body of Christ, should act esteeming one another better than ourselves? No, they're not acting like that. And then you get over and he says, he says this, <laughs> he says in verse 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. You ever eat too much? I have this weekend. You know how you feel? Ugh, sick, right? What happens when you're hungry? Oh, I'm weak. I need to get some food in me. What happens when you drink too much? You fall asleep. How many people are sleeping in the verse? And many sleep. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 11 teach us? It teaches us this. It teaches us that there was drunkards there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 teaches us that there's idolaters amongst them. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 teaches us that he has, to, he has to tell them how to avoid fornication and adultery. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 teaches us that there's people there that are wrapped up in fornication. And earlier in 1 Corinthians, we learned that one says, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos. That's, that's just, that's covetousness as well, right? I mean, you can go through and just start naming these things left and right in the book of Corinthians, but he says unto them, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified. You should glory in that truth. That when you find yourself in one of these lists, God says that's not who you are anymore. Isn't that exciting information? There's two other passages that are very close to this. The first one's Ephesians chapter 5. The second one is Galatians chapter 5. And let's go there. And the reason they're close in, to these is because they teach us that these folks, and he gives us a list, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 1 says, Be ye therefore followers of dear God, or of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ hath loved us and hath given, us, given himself for us as an offering 
and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. So verse 2, what's the first thing that he tells you to do? And walk in what? Walk in love. So that kind of sets up the context here. What's he telling us to do? He's telling us to walk in love. He says, but fornication and uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. There's the identity truth again, right? You're in Christ. You're a saint. You're washed. You're sanctified. You're justified. There's certain things that don't become you now. They were perfectly natural for you in the flesh, in Adam. But now you're something else. You're a new creature. You're, 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 you're a member of the church, the body of Christ. Your life is hid. There's things that don't become you anymore. And what are they? So he's telling us things that don't become us. He says in verse 4, Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon who? The children of disobedience. Who's he talking about in those verses? He's talking about the children of disobedience. Matter of fact, if you go back to Ephesians chapter 2, he talks about, and we were by nature, what? Children of wrath. Why were we children of wrath? Well, this verse tells us, because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon upon the children of disobedience. He's telling you this is a picture of the children of disobedience. You're supposed to walk in love. And if you read these things, they have nothing to do with love. Fornication, all uncleanness or covetousness, filthiness, that's defrauding one another. Foolish jesting or foolish talking or jesting. And and those are all based on the uncleanness of in that that we don't want to defraud each other with that kind of communication because that's not walking in love it's not that if you do those things it's done it's that you're not that person anymore in christ galatians chapter five do you see that you see that and how that's it's it's not about those things in that passage i hope so galatians Galatians chapter 5, very very similar. Galatians chapter 5. And let's just get a little bit of context. It says in verse 17, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led by the spirit, you're not under the law. How are you led by the spirit, by the way? How are you led by the Spirit? Because it's the Word, right? The Holy Spirit is going to lead in your life through the Word itself. So as you read the Word and you digest the Word and you take the Word in, as that Word starts to produce fruit in your life, the fruit of the Spirit, which we'll get into in just a second, we get that truth in there of who we are. We understand what God did. And out of gratitude, we want to love and each other and love him and serve him so we get led by the spirit by studying getting the word in us verse 19 now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these adultery fornication uncleanness does this sound familiar lasciviousness idolatry witchcraft hatred variance emulations wrath strife seditions heresies envying murders drunkenness revelings and such like of the which I tell you, tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So there he gives you a picture of what you look like in your flesh. Verse 22, he's going to give you a picture, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh and with the affections and the lusts. And let's get to the conclusion of the matter. Verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And you know what? Have you noticed what in all these passages he brings it back to? Richard brought this up. In in Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you, right? 
And what's that mind? What do we do in the body of Christ? We serve one another. Do you, do you notice? Look at verse 26. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Do you notice he always brings it back? So he, he takes the issue off of you and he puts it back on those around you because when you behave in manners like this, they're inconsistent with how we should behave in Christ and they're putting ourselves and we're esteeming our fleshly lusts more than we're esteem, esteeming those around us. Isn't that exactly what was going on with the Corinthians? He gets to the end of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and he says, Wherefore, tarry one for another. That's the conclusion of it. Tarry one for another. Take care of one another. Serve one another. Because when you, in these things, you're not acting like a member of the body of Christ. You're not acting like who you are in Christ. These are character issues. They're issues of who you are. They're identity issues. So, what those passages, those three passages that we looked at, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 6, what those, Galatians chapter 5, I'm sorry, what they teach you is that in the flesh, okay, that's what people look like. In Christ, we're something different. We don't do those things any longer. It's about who you are in Christ. And what that shows you, when you take a big look at the Corinthians, and Paul's actually writing a letter to save people. You know they're saved. He tells them they're babes in Christ. So what's that tell you? They're in Christ. Now, when you look at them in the flesh, do they look like it? No. So does he say, throw up his hands, I'm done with you guys. God's taken back the loan of salvation, and you're out. <laughs> no. He reminds them of who they are. He has them walk in the spirit a little bit by hearing the word. Judging them a little bit. Telling them how to do things a little better. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Let's get into, let's get into I can't keep up. I'm going to lose my salvation thinking, okay? So the first was I do something so bad that I lose my salvation. The second one is this. It's I can't keep up, so I'm going to lose it. And this is Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And the teaching here that people generally give is, look, you better think about your salvation with fear and trembling because if you don't work right, if you don't keep up, if you don't do things the way we tell you, you're, you're in big trouble. It'll be gone. You'll lose it. And you know, there's a lot of people who live like that. They live in fear that they're not doing enough. Well, you're not, right? <laughs> you're, you're not doing enough. You can't do enough. That's why Christ had to do it. Tom brought up this verse last night, and it's very simple. You look at verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to do and to do of his good to, to do of his good pleasure. If you go to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's an encouraging verse, isn't it? And when you think about that in light of Philippians chapter 2, the reason he tells you to work out your own salvation is not to work to keep your salvation. It's because who's in you doing the work, and as he's in you doing the work, guess what it's going to do? It's just going to blow out of you, right? You're going you're, you're to go out there, and you're going to work out your salvation. It doesn't mean you're working for it. It means he's working in you, and it's working out of you. It's glorying in that gospel and who you are in Christ. It has nothing to do with working for your salvation. It doesn't say that. It's about who's working in you. It's back to who you are. See that? All these just go back to who you are. You know why I think that is? 1 Corinthians chapter 2 tells us that. You don't have to turn there. Sorry. We've got his spirit. Why? Not only does he give us free salvation, but he wants us to know the things that are freely given to us. 
right? It brings God joy and pleasure to show you the, all the things that he's freely given to you, including your salvation. That's why he keeps pointing us back to who we are. Go to Philippians chapter 3. And here's how this teaching goes. You guys like Paul, right? Well, Paul wasn't even sure of his salvation. All right? Philippians chapter 3, verse 11 says, If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. He's not there yet. He's working hard so that he can attain to the resurrection of the dead. You ever heard somebody say that to you? Okay. <laughs> I have. These are legitimate things people look at. Well, how do we reconcile that with verse 9, which says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That just tells you that he's not a trying, trying to attain to salvation anymore because it's going to be him being found in him, not having his own righteousness. And he just got done listing his righteousness in the flesh, which I guarantee looks a lot better than your righteousness in the flesh. And he says it's done. So if you think that your righteousness is going to look better than that, then we need to all give up now. Because it's not. Luckily, we don't have to give up because it's not our righteousness. You remember when he said the unrighteous in 1 Corinthians? We've been made righteous. It's not our righteousness, it's his righteousness. So what do I do with verse 11? Well, verse 10 says that I may know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He's not talking about he hopes that he's going to be a part of the redemption to wit, or the adoption to wit, the redemption of the body. He's not saying, I'm working hard to hope that. What he's saying is, I have eternal life, right? I have Jesus Christ's righteousness. It's been imputed onto me. And I want my life here on this earth to match what it's going to look like in eternity, that I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. You see that in his walk? He wants his walk to look as close as it can to what it's going to look like in eternity. So he's trying to lay hold onto that eternal life. It's there. We've got it. It's not that he's trying to for salvation, but it's there. It's a possession, and I'm going to lay hold on it, and it's going to work in me and work out of me. That's how you attain to the resurrection of the dead, right? It's another character issue, a character of Christ working in us and working out of us. That the life of Christ might be manifest where? In our mortal flesh. All right. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We've got a few more minutes to hit this one. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter 2. Verse 10, Paul says, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is a faith, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he, will also, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So here's how the argument goes. Let's just pretend verse 13 doesn't exist. That's step one of the argument. Okay? We've got to get rid of that. So verse 13 doesn't exist. It probably wasn't in the earliest manuscripts. Saying, no, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm being silly. But it, it, it says there in verse... 12, if we suffer, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he will do what? And that's a faithful saying. It, 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 on the surface, you're like, "Woo, this is trouble. Because if Peter denied him, there's a sure bet that I can. 
And if I do, what happens? Verse right there says, he'll deny you. Let's just back off for a second and think about this passage. First thing I want to show you about this passage is, and some of this stuff, if, if, if you disagree with, just throw it out and disagree with it. But I believe this passage is actually a picture of the book of Romans. First thing he says, it is a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Where might you find that in the book of Romans? Hmm? Romans chapter 6, right? We already read the verse. When we trust, what are we? We're buried into his death. So that's, that's a clear statement about that, right? So let's look at the next thing. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Where do we learn about suffering in Romans? Romans chapter 8, right? And, and it talks about if we suffer there. And by the way, we all suffer. The whole passage of Romans chapter 8, let's go there real quick. The whole passage of Romans chapter 8 is that we suffer in a creation that is cursed with sin. Right? That's why in verse 18 he says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. By the way, you couldn't say that if you were going to lose your salvation. Verse 21. Because the creature itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Does being in the bondage of corruption sound like suffering? It does to me. Verse 22. For the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in what? Pain. And who is involved in that? The whole creation. In pain together. You suffer? You do. Suffering doesn't have to be torture. Just living on a sin-cursed world. Just living with yourself, by the way, sometimes is suffering. I've learned that about myself. Because my sin nature gets the better of me sometimes. And we don't want that, do we? Back to 2 Timothy. So there we see Romans chapter 8. Then he says... If we deny him, he will. He also will deny us. And you say, well, where's that found in Romans? Well, if, if, if we continue, if we look at Second Timothy chapter 2 as a whole, he says in verse 1, thou, ther thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach also, others also. Verse 3 says, therefore, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man strive for mastery, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. So when he's talking about striving for masteries there, and you get down to the bottom of the chapter, and he says, if a man therefore purge himself of these. Well, what these are thee? They're in verse 20. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver and also of wood and of earth, but some to honor and dishonor. What's that sound like? What's that sound like? Does it sound like 1 Corinthians chapter 3? It does. What do we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? The judgment seat of Christ. Where else do we find that? Romans chapter 14. Good. You see that? So you see a picture of the judgment seat of the Christ there when it says if we deny him, he will deny us. Now you say, well, how are you going to deny him? And, and it, it, sounds, it's, it sounds very serious here. And scripturally, you've got to come up with a place to say, okay, what verse can I, can I, can I, can I deal with this with? Well, go to, go, to, go, to second, or go to Colossians chapter 2. And let me give you a verse to deal with this with. In Colossians chapter 2, he says in verse 19, in verse 18, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. See that? Don't let any man beguile you of your reward. And how are you going to be beguiled of your reward there? In a voluntary, in voluntary humility and a worshiping of angels. Now, by the way, that doesn't have to be a little winged angel up here that you bow down to, all right? If you follow seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, guess who you're worshiping? Right? Pretty simple. 
So he, he talks about that, and he says that there, and worshiping of angels, intruding in those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So this person's in the flesh, and there's a possibility that they can be beguiled out of their reward. Are they going to lose their salvation? It says, don't let any man beguile you out of your reward. When they're beguiled of their, out of their reward, what are they not doing? Verse 19, and not holding the head. Does, does it sound like if I didn't hold the head and I went over here and said, I'm going to worship angels. I'm going to operate in a voluntary humility. I'm going to operate in the flesh and the traditions of men. Does that sound like what you're supposed to be doing with Christ? Is that holding the head and saying, Christ is the head of the church, the body of Christ, and this is who we serve? Is that? No. That's a, we're supposed to be doing that. We're supposed to be holding the head, not operating in this, not being beguiled out of our reward. That's what Colossians chapter 2 is about. That's why he teaches you who you are in Christ. You're complete. You're circumcised with circumcision made without hands. You're buried with him in baptism. He's forgiven you how many trespasses? All. And he's taken the handwriting of ordinances that against you and nailed them to his cross. So when you look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, you can see here that he's talking, I believe, about the judgment seat of Christ right there. Now in verse 13, he says this, he says, and this is powerful. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny he, he, he can, if we deny, or I'm sorry, got to reset. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he, he cannot deny himself, right? Where do you find that in Romans chapter 3? Or, <laughs> you find that in Romans chapter 3. So, what if the unbelief, what, what if some did not believe, believe, shall their unbelief make the, got a none effect, right? And the question there, and what's the answer to the question? God forbid, right? And what that is, is that's a verse that teaches you about God's character. He promised things to Israel. Just because they didn't believe doesn't mean he's not going to give them to them. He's going to give them to them, right? He's going to write his law in their hearts. He's going to take care of it himself. And this tells us that if we believe not, what happens? If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Why can't he deny himself? Because you're in him. You're, you're dead. You're not the issue. Your life is hidden him. And he's not going to deny himself. Romans chapter 11 is another place where people use this, where it says, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be what? Cut off. People say, well, if you don't continue in his goodness, you'll be cut off. Well, that's... That's a passage that's written to, to the Gentiles as a whole. Paul says, I speak to you Gentiles, right? He's saying, this is what happened to Israel. Now I'm speaking to you guys corporately. It has nothing to do with that. Folks, when you look at these verses and you believe these verses, and I'm going to conclude here in just one second. When you believe these verses, they don't teach you that you can lose your salvation as the world tries to and the uh, churchianity teaches you. They teach you how seated you are in your salvation and how permanent it is and how wonderful it is and that it's not just, as Dave's taught, salvation from hell, but it's salvation from a vain fleshly life as well because of who you are in Christ. Last thing, the book of Galatians as a whole is a picture that even if you walk into another gospel, Paul still tells them they're sons, right? Right? Who hath bewitched you? They walked away from the gospel into another gospel. And does he say, come on, guys, down front to the altar, you're confessing again. He reminds them of who they are in Christ, right? In the book of Corinthians, you have a church in the flesh. Paul doesn't tell them you're out. He tells them this is who you are. The book of Galatians, you see... Folks who have gone into spiritual bondage again. They've put themselves back under the law. He says, if you be circumcised, what profit does Christ have, right? You see a picture of somebody who even walked away from the gospel. And guess what they are? Still saved. These things saturate the epistles. They're there. They're there for us to look at. They're there for us to read. They're there for us on the days that we 
we feel like we're not saved to look at and say, wait a minute. That's not what the Bible teaches me. That's not who I am. The more of that we have in us, the less we are to be beguiled by these things. I encourage you to study these verses. There's, there's other ones that people use, but these are the main ones that I find people try to throw at you. Folks, you're complete in Him. It's not your righteousness, it's His righteousness. It wasn't anything that you'd done. Just rest in that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the people that are here. We thank you for the truth that's contained in your word. We thank you that you commended your love toward us. Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.